the dying of the dragons. A son for a son. Aegon had been proclaimed king in the dragon pit, Rhaenyra queen on Dragonstone. All efforts at reconciliation having failed, the Dance of the Dragons now began in earnest. On Driftmark, the Sea Snake's ships set sail from Hull and Spicetown to close the gullet, choking off trade to and from King's Landing. Soon after, Jaceris Valerian was flying north upon his dragon, Vermax. His brother Lucerus, south on Arax, whilst Prince Daemon flew Seraxes to the Trident. Let us turn first to Harrenhal. Though large parts of Harren's great folly were in ruins, the castle's towering curtain walls made it still formidable a stronghold as any in the Riverlands. But Aegon the Dragon had proved it vulnerable from the sky. With its lord, Larry Strong, away in King's Landing, the castle was but lightly garrisoned. Having no wish to suffer the fate of Black Harren, its elderly Castilian, Sir Simon Strong, uncle to the late Lord Lionel, great-uncle to Lord Larry's, was quick to strike his banners when Saraxes lighted atop King Pyre Tower. In addition to the castle, Prince Daemon, at a stroke, had captured the not inconsiderable wealth of House Strong and a dozen valuable hostages. Amongst them, Sir Simon and his grandsons. The castle small folk became his captives as well, amongst them, a wet nurse named Alice Rivers. Who was this woman? A serving wench who dabbled in potions and spells, says Munkin. A wood witch, claims Septim Eustace. A malign enchantress who bathed in the blood of virgins to preserve her youth, Mushroom would have us believe. Her name suggests bastard birth, but we know little of her father and less of her mother. Munkin and Eustace tells us she was sired by Lord Lionel Strong in his callow youth, making her a natural half-sister to his sons, Harwin, Breakbones, and Larry's, the Clubfoot. But Mushroom insists that she was much older, that she was a wet nurse to both boys, perhaps even to their father a generation earlier. Though her own children had all been stillborns, the milk that flowed so abundantly from the breasts of Alice Rivers had nourished countless babes born of other women at Harrenhal. Was she in truth a witch who lay with demons, bringing forth dead children as payment for the knowledge they gave her? A wanton who used her poisons and potions to bind men to her, body and soul? Alice Rivers was at least 40 years of age during the Dance of the Dragons. That much is known. Mushroom makes her even older. All agree that she looked younger than her years, but whether this was simple happenstance or achieved through her practice of the dark arts, men continue to dispute. Whatever her powers, it would seem Daemon Targaryen was immune to them, for little is heard of this supposed sorceress whilst the prince held Harrenhal. The sudden, bloodless fall of Black Harren's seat was counted a great victory for Queen Rhaenyra and her blacks. It served as a sharp reminder of the martial prowess of Prince Daemon and the power of Seraxes, the blood worm, and gave the queen a stronghold in the heart of Westeros, to which her supporters could rally, and Rhaenyra had many such in the lands watered by the trident. When Prince Daemon sent forth his call to arms, they rose up along the rivers, Knights, and men-at-arms, and humble peasants who yet remembered the realm's delight. So beloved of her father, and the way she smiled and charmed them as she made her progress through the riverlands in her youth. Hundreds, and then thousands, buckled on their sword belts and donned their mail, or grabbed a pitchfork, or a hoe, and a crude wooden shield, and began to make their way to Harrenhal to fight for Viserys's little girl. The Lords of the Trident, having more to lose, were not so quick to move, but soon enough, they too began to throw their lots in with the Queen. From the twins rode Sir Forrest Frey, the very same Fool Frey, who had once begged for Rhaenyra's hand, now grown into a most puissant knight. Lord Samuel Blackwood, who had once lost a duel for her favor, raised her banners over Raventree. Sir Amos Bracken, who had won that duel, followed his lord father when House Bracken declared for Aegon. The Moontons of Maidenpool, the Pipers of Pink Maiden Castle, the Roots of Haraway, the Dairies of Derry, the Malisters of Seaguard, and the Vances of Wayfarer's Rest 
all announced their support for Rhaenyra. The Vances of Atranta took the other path and trumpeted their allegiance to the young king. Peter Piper, the grizzled lord of Pink Maiden, spoke for many when he said, I swore my sword. I'm older now, but not so old that I've forgotten the words I said. And it happens, I still have the sword. The Lord Paramount of the Trident, Grover Tully, had been an old man even at the Great Council of 101, where he spoke for Prince Viserys. Though now failing, he was no less stubborn. He had favored the rights of the male claimant in 101, and the years had not changed his views. Lord Grover insisted that River Run would fight for young King Aegon, yet no such word went forth. The old lord was bedridden and would not live much longer. I would sooner the rest of us did not die with him, declared Sir Elmo Tully, his grandson. River Run had no defense against Dragonfire, he pointed out to his own sons, and both sides in this fight rode dragons. And so whilst Lord Grover thundered and fulminated from his deathbed, River Run barred its gates, manned its walls, and held its silence. Meanwhile, a very different story was playing out to the east, where Jaceris Valerian descended upon the Eyrie on his young dragon, Vermax, to win the Veil of Aaron for his mother. The maiden of the Veil, Lady J.N. Aaron, was five and thirty, more than twenty years his senior. Never wed, Lady J.N. had reigned over the Vale since the death of her father and elder brothers at the hands of the stone crows of the hills when she was three. Mushroom tells us that this famous maiden was in truth a highborn harlot with a voracious appetite for men, and gives us a salacious tale of how she offered Prince Jaceris the allegiance of the Vale only if he could bring her to her climax with his tongue. Septon Eustace repeats that widespread rumor that Jane Aaron preferred the intimate companionship of other women, then goes on to say it was not true. In this instance, we must be grateful for Grand Maester Munkin's true telling, for he alone confines himself to the high halls of the Eyrie rather than its bedchambers. Thrice have mine own kin sought to replace me, Lady Jane told Prince Jaceris. My cousin, Sir Arnold, is wont to say that women are too soft to rule. I have him in one of my sky cells, if you would like to ask him. Your Prince Damon used his first wife most cruelly, it is true, but notwithstanding your mother's poor taste in consorts, she remains our rightful queen, and mine own blood besides. An Erin on her mother's side, in this world of men, we women must band together. The Vale and its knights shall stand with her. if. Her grace will grant me one request. When the prince asked what that might be, she answered, Dragons, I have no fear of armies. Many and more have broken themselves against my bloody gate, and the Eyrie is known to be impregnable. But you have descended on us from the sky, as Queen Visenya once did during the conquest, and I was powerless to halt you. I mislike feeling powerless. Send me dragon riders. And so the prince agreed and Lady J.N. knelt before him, and bade her warriors to kneel, and all swore him their swords. Then on, Jaceris soared, north across the fingers and the waters of the Bight. He lighted briefly at Sisterton, where Lord Barrel and Lord Sunderlin did obeisance to him and pledged him the support of the three sisters. Then flew on to White Harbor, where Lord Desmond Manderley met with him in his merman's court. Here, the prince faced a shrewder bargainer. White Harbor is not unsympathetic to your mother's plight, Manderley declared. Mine own forebearers were despoiled of their birthright when our enemies drove us into exile on these cold northern shores. When the old king visited us so long ago, he spoke of the wrong that had been done to us and promised to make redress. In pledge of that, his grace offered the hand of his daughter, Princess Visera, to my great-grandsire, that our two houses might be made as one. But the girl died, and the promise was forgotten. Prince Jaceris knew what was being asked of him. Before he left White Harbor, a compact was drawn up and signed by the terms of which Lord Manderley's youngest daughter would be wed to the prince's brother, Joffrey, once the war was over. Finally, Vermax carried Jaceris Valerian to Winterfell to treat with its formidable young lord, Cregan Stark. In the fullness of time, 
Cregan Stark would become known as the Old Man of the North. But the Lord of Winterfell, but was one and twenty when Prince Jaceris came to him in 129 AC. Cregan had come into his lordship at thirteen upon the death of his father, Lord Rickon, in 121 AC. During his minority, his uncle Benard had ruled the North as regent, but in 124 AC, Cregan turned sixteen, only to find his uncle slow to surrender his power. Relations between the two grew strained, as the young lord chafed under the limits imposed upon him by his father's brother. Finally, in 126 AC, Cregan Stark rose up, imprisoned Benard and his three sons, and took the rule of the North into his own hands. Soon after, he wed Lady Era Nori, a beloved companion since childhood, only to have her die in 128 AC, whilst giving birth to a son and heir, whom Cregan named Rickon after his father. Autumn was well advanced when the Prince of Dragonstone came to Winterfell. The snows lay deep upon the ground, a cold wind was howling from the north, and Lord Stark was in the midst of his preparations for the coming winter. Yet he gave Jaceris a warm welcome. Snow and ice and cold made Vermax ill-tempered, it is said, so the prince did not linger amongst the Northmen. But many a curious tale came out of that short sojourn. Munkin's true telling says that Cregan and Jaceris took a liking to each other, for the boy prince reminded the Lord of Winterfell of his own younger brother, who had died ten years before. They drank together, hunted together, trained together, and swore an oath of brotherhood, sealed in blood. This seems more credible than Septim Eustace's version, wherein the prince spends most of his visit attempting to persuade Lord Cregan to give up his false gods and accept the worship of the Seven. But we turn to Mushroom to find the tales other chroniclers omit, nor does he fail us now. His account introduces a young maiden, or, quote, wolf girl, as he dubs, with the name of Sarah Snow. So smitten was Prince Jaceris with this creature, a bastard daughter of the late Lord Rickon Stark, that he lay with her of a night. On learning that his guest had claimed the maidenhead of his bastard sister, Lord Cregan became most wroth, and only softened when Sarah Snow told him that the prince had taken her for his wife. They had spoken their vows in Winterfell's own godswoods before a heart tree, and only then had she given herself to him, wrapped in furs amidst the snows as the old gods looked on. This makes for a charming story to be sure, but as with many of Mushroom's fables, it seems to partake more of a fool's fevered imaginations than of historical truth. Jaceris Valerian had been betrothed to his cousin Bela since he was four and she was two, and from all we know of his character, it seems most unlikely that he would break such a solemn agreement to protect the uncertain virtue of some half-wild, unwashed northern bastard. If indeed there ever lived a Sarah Snow, and if indeed the Prince of Dragonstone perchanced to dally with her, that is no more than other princes have done in the past, and will do on the morrow. But to talk of marriage is preposterous. Mushroom also claims that Vermax left a clutch of dragon's eggs at Winterfell, which is equally absurd. Whilst it is true that determining the sex of a living dragon is nigh on an impossible task, no other source mentions Vermax producing so much as a single egg, so it must be assumed that he was male. Septum Barth's speculation that the dragons change sex at need, being, quote, as mutable as flame, is too ludicrous to consider. This we do know. Cregan Stark and Jaceris Valerian reached an accord and signed and sealed the agreement that Grandmaster Munkin calls the Pact of Ice and Fire. In his true telling, like many such pacts, it was to be sealed with a marriage. Lord Cregan's son, Rickon, was a year old. Prince Jaceris was as yet unmarried and childless, but it was assumed that he would sire children of his own once his mother sat the Iron Throne. Under the terms of the pact, the prince's firstborn daughter would be sent north at the age of seven to be fostered at Winterfell until such time as she was old enough to marry Lord Cregan's heir. 
When the Prince of Dragonstone took his dragon back into the cold autumn sky, he did so with the knowledge that he had won three powerful lords and all their bannermen for his mother. Though his fifteenth name day was still half a year away, Prince Jaceris had proved himself a man and a worthy heir to the Iron Throne. Had his brother's shorter, safer flight gone as well, much bloodshed and grief might well have been averted. The tragedy that befell Lucerus Valerian at Storm's End was never planned. On this, all our sources agree. The first battles in the Dance of the Dragons were fought with quills and ravens, with threats and promises, decrees and blandishments. The murder of Lord Beesbury at the Green Council was not yet widely known. Most believed his lordship to be languished in some dungeon. Whilst sundry familiar faces were no longer seen about court, no heads had appeared above the castle gates, and many still hoped that the question of succession might still be resolved peacefully. The stranger had other plans. For surely it was his dread hand behind the ill chance that brought the two princelings together at Storm's End. When the dragon Arax raced before a gathering storm to deliver Lucerus Valerian to the safety of the castle yard, only to find Aemon Targaryen there before him. Boros Baratheon was a man of much different character than his father. Lord Boromond was stone, hard and strong and unmoving, Septim Eustace tells us. Lord Boros was the wind that rages and howls and blows this way and that. Prince Aemon had been uncertain what sort of welcome he would receive when he set out, but Storm's End welcomed him with feasts and hunts and jousting. Lord Boros proved more than willing to entertain his suit. I have four daughters, he told the prince. Choose any you like. Cass is the oldest. She'll be the first to flower, but Floris is prettier. And, if it's a clever wife you want, there's Maris. Rhaenyra had taken House Baratheon for granted for too long, his lordship told Aemond. Aye, Princess Rhaenys's kin to me and mine, some great aunt I never knew was married to her father, but the both of them are dead. And Rhaenyra, she's not Rhaenys, is she? He had nothing against women, Lord Boros went on to say. He loved his girls, a daughter is a precious thing. But a son, ah. Should the gods ever grant him a son of his own blood, Storm's End would pass to him, not to his sisters. Why should the Iron Throne be any different? And with a royal marriage in the offing, Rhaenyra's cause was lost. She would see that when she learned that she had lost Storm's End. He would tell her so himself. Bow down to your brother, I, it's for the best. His girls would fight with each other sometimes, the way girls do but he saw to it that they always made peace afterwards. We have no record of which daughter Prince Aemon finally decided on, though Mushroom tells us that he kissed all four to, quote, taste the nectar of their lips. Save that it was not Morris. Munkin writes that the prince and Lord Boros were haggling over dates and dowries on the morning Lucerus Valerian appeared. Vagar sensed his coming first. Guardsmen walking the battlements of the castle's mighty curtain walls clutched their spears in sudden terror when she woke with a roar that shook the very foundations of Durin's defiance. Even Arox quailed before that sound, we are told, and Luke plied his whip freely as he forced him down. Mushroom would have us believe that the lightning was flashing to the east and a heavy rain falling as Lucerus leapt off his dragon, his mother's message, clutched in his hand. He must surely have known what Vagar's presence meant, so it would have come as no surprise when Aemon Targaryen confronted him in the round hall before the eyes of Lord Boros, his four daughters, Septum and Maester, and two score knights, guards, and servants. Amongst those who witnessed the meeting was Sir Byron Swan, second son of Lord of Stonehelm in the Dornish Marches who would have his own small part to play later in the dance. So here, for once, we need not rely entirely on Grand Maester Munken, Mushroom, and Septim Eustace. None of them were present at Storm's End, but many others were, so we have no shortage of first-hand accounts.
Look at this sad creature, my lord, Prince Aemon called out. Little Luke Strong the Bastard. To Luke, he said, You are wet, bastard. Is it raining, or did you piss yourself in fear? Lucerus Valerian addressed himself only to Lord Baratheon. Lord Boros, I have brought you a message from my mother, the Queen. The whore of Dragonstone, he means. Prince Aemon strode forward and made to snatch the letter from Lucerus's hand, but Lord Boros roared a command, and his knights intervened, pulling the princelings apart. One brought Rhaenyra's letter to the dais, where his lordship sat upon the throne of the Storm Kings of old. No man can truly know what Boros Baratheon was feeling at that moment. The accounts of those who were there differ markedly one from the other. Some say his lordship was red-faced and abashed, as a man might be if his lawful wife found him abed with another woman. Others declare that Lord Boros appeared to be relishing the moment, for it pleased his vanity to have both king and queen seeking his support. Mushroom, who was not there, says he was drunk. Septim Eustace, who was not there, says he was fearful. Yet all the witnesses agree on what Lord Boros said and did. Never a man of letters, he handed the Queen's letter to his maester, who cracked the seal and whispered the message into his lordship's ear. A frown stole across Lord Boros' face. He stroked his beard, scowled at Lucerus Valerian, and said, And if I do as your mother bids, which one of my daughters will you marry, boy? He gestured at his four girls. Pick one. Prince Lucerus could only blush. My lord, I am not free to marry, he replied. I am betrothed to my cousin, Reyna. I thought as much, Lord Boros said. Go home, pup, and tell the bitch your mother that the Lord of Storm's End is not a dog that she can whistle up and need to set against her foes and Prince Lucerus turned to take his leave of the round hall. But Prince Aemon drew his sword and said, Hold strong. First, pay the debt you owe me. Then tore off his eye patch and flung it to the floor to show the sapphire beneath. You have a knife, just as you did then. Put out your eye and I will let you leave. One will serve. I would not blind you. Prince Lucerus recalled his promise to his mother. I will not fight you. I came here as an envoy, not a knight. You came here as a craven and a traitor, Prince Aemon answered. I will have your eye or your life strong. At that, Lord Boros grew uneasy. Not here, he grumbled. He came as an envoy. I want no bloodshed beneath this roof. So his guards put themselves between the princelings and escorted Lucerus Valerian from the round hall back to the castle yard where his dragon, Arax, was hunched down in the rain awaiting his return. And there it might have ended, but for this girl, Marys, the second-born daughter of Lord Boros, less comely than her sisters, she was angry with Aemon for preferring them to her. Was it one of your eyes he took, or one of your balls? Maris asked the prince. I am so glad you chose my sister. I want a husband with all his parts. Aemon Targaryen's mouth twisted in a rage, and he turned once more to Lord Boros, asking for his leave. The Lord of Storm's End shrugged and answered, It is not for me to tell you what to do when you are not beneath my roof. And his knights moved aside as Prince Aemon rushed to the doors. Outside, the storm was raging. Thunder rolled across the castle, the rain fell in blinding sheets, and from time to time, great bolts of blue-white lightning lit the world as bright as day. It was bad weather for flying, even for a dragon, and Arax was struggling to stay aloft when Prince Aemond mounted Vagar and went after him. Had the sky been calm, Prince Lucerus might have been able to outfly his pursuer, for Arax was younger and swifter. But the day was as black as Prince Aemon's heart, says Mushroom, and so it came to pass that the dragons met above Shipbreaker Bay. Watchers on the castle walls saw distant blasts of flame, and heard a shriek cut the thunder. Then the two beasts were locked together, lightning crackling around them. Vagar was five times the size of her foe, the hardened survivor of a hundred battles. If there was a fight, 
it could not have lasted long. Our axe fell, broken, to be swallowed by the storm-lashed waters of the bay. His head and neck washed up beneath the cliffs below Storm's End three days later, to make a feast for crabs and seagulls. Mushroom claims that Prince Lucerus's corpse washed up as well, and tells us that Prince Aemon cut out his eye and presented them to Lady Morris on a bed of seaweed, but this seems excessive. Some say Vagar snatched Lucerus off his dragon's back and swallowed him whole. It has even been claimed that the prince survived his fall, swam to safety, but lost all memory of who he was, spending the rest of his days as a simple-minded fisherman. The true telling gives all these tales the respect they deserve, which is to say, none. Lucerus Valerian died with his dragon, Munkin insists. This is undoubtedly correct. The prince was 13 years of age, his body was never found, and with his death, the war of ravens and envoys and marriage pacts came to an end, and the war of fire and blood began in earnest. Aemon Targaryen, who would henceforth be known as Aemon, the kinslayer to his foes, returned to King's Landing, having won the support of Storm's End for his brother Aegon, and the undying enmity of Queen Rhaenyra. If he thought to receive a hero's welcome, he was disappointed. Queen Alicent went pale when she heard what he had done, crying, Mother have mercy on us all. Nor was Sir Otto pleased. You only lost one eye, he is reported to have said. How could you have been so blind? The king himself did not share their concerns, however. Aegon II welcomed Prince Aemond home with a great feast hailed him as the true blood of the dragon, and announced that he made a good beginning. On Dragonstone, Queen Rhaenyra collapsed when told of Luke's death. Luke's younger brother Joffrey, Jace still away on his mission north, swore a terrible oath of vengeance against Prince Aemond and Lord Boros. Only the intervention of the Sea Snake and Princess Rhaenys kept the boy from mounting his dragon at once. Mushroom would have us believe he played a part as well. As the Black Council sat to consider how to strike back, a raven arrived from Harrenhal. An eye for an eye, a son for a son, Prince Daemon wrote. Lucerus shall be avenged. Let it not be forgotten, in his youth, Daemon Targaryen had been the prince of the city. His face and laugh familiar to every cut purse, whore, and gambler in Flea Bottom. The prince still had friends in low places of King's Landing, and followers amongst the gold cloaks. Unbeknownst to King Aegon, the Hand, or the Dowager Queen, he had allies at court as well, even on the Green Council. And one other go-between, a special friend he trusted utterly, who knew the wine sinks and rat pits that festered in the shadow of the Red Keep, as well as Daemon himself once had, and moved easily through the shadows of the city. To this pale stranger, he reached out now, by secret ways, to set a terrible vengeance into motion. Amidst the stews of Flea Bottom, Prince Damon's go-between found suitable instruments. One had been a surgeon in the City Watch. Big and brutal, he had lost his gold cloak for beating a whore to death whilst in a drunken rage. The other was a rat catcher in the Red Keep. Their true names are lost to history. They are remembered, would that they were not, as blood and cheese. Cheese knew the Red Keep better than the shape of his own cock, Mushroom tells us. The hidden doors and secret tunnels that Magor the Cruel had built were as familiar to the rat catcher as the rats he hunted. Using a forgotten passageway, Cheese led blood into the heart of the castle. Unseen by any guard, some say their quarry was the king himself. But Aegon was accompanied by the Kingsguard wherever he went, and even Cheese knew of no way in and out of Magor's Holdfast, save over the drawbridge that spanned the dry moat and its formidable iron spikes. The Tower of the Hand was less secure. The two men crept up through the walls, bypassing the spearmen posted at the tower doors. Sir Otto's rooms were of no interest to them, Instead, they slipped into his daughter's chambers, one floor below. Queen Alicent had taken up residence there after the death of King Viserys, when her son Aegon moved into Magor's Holdfast with his own queen. Once inside, 
Cheese bound and gagged the Dowager Queen whilst blood strangled her bedmaid. Then, they settled down to wait, for they knew it was the custom of Queen Helena to bring her children to see their grandmother every evening before bed. Blind to her danger, the Queen appeared as dusk was settling over the castle. Accompanied by her three children, Jeharis and Jehera were six, Maelor two. As they entered the apartments, Helena was holding his little hand and calling out her mother's name. Blood barred the door and slew the queen's guardsmen, whilst Cheese appeared to snatch up Maelor. Scream, and you all die, Blood told her grace. Queen Helena kept her calm, it is said. Who are you? she demanded of the two. Debt collectors, said Cheese. An eye for an eye, a son for a son. We only want the one to square things. Won't hurt the rest of you fine folks. Not one little hair. Which one you want to lose, your grace? Once she realized what he meant, Queen Helena pleaded with the men to kill her instead. A wife's not a son, said Blood. It has to be a boy. Cheese warned the queen to make a good choice soon, before Blood grew bored and raped her little girl. Pick, he said, or we kill them all. On her knees, weeping, Helena named her youngest, Maelor. Perhaps she thought the boy was too young to understand, or perhaps it was because the older boy, Jeharis, was King Aegon's firstborn son and heir, next in line to the Iron Throne. You hear that, little boy? Cheese whispered to Maelor, Your mama wants you dead. Then he gave blood a grin, and the hulking swordsman slew Prince Jeharis, striking off the boy's head with a single blow. The queen began to scream. Strange to say, the rat catcher and the butcher were true to their word. They did no further harm to Queen Helena or her surviving children, but rather fled with the prince's head in hand. A hue and cry went up, but Cheese knew the secret passageways, as the guards did not, and the killers made their escape. Two days later, blood was seized at the gate of the gods trying to leave King's Landing with the head of Prince Jeharis hidden in one of his saddle sacks. Under torture, he confessed that he had been taking it to Harrenhal to collect his reward from Prince Daemon. He also gave up a description of the whore he claimed had hired them. An older woman, foreign by her talk, cloaked and hooded, very pale. The other harlots called her misery. After thirteen days of torment, Blood was at last allowed to die. Queen Alicent had commanded Larry's Clubfoot to learn his true name so that she might bathe in the blood of his wife and children. But our sources do not say if this occurred. Sir Luthor Largent and his gold cloaks searched the streets of silk from top to bottom and turned out and stripped every harlot in King's Landing, but no trace of cheese or the white worm was ever found. In his grief and fury, King Aegon II commanded that all the city rat catchers be taken out and hanged, and this was done. Sir Otto Hightower brought 100 cats into the Red Keep to take their place. Though blood and cheese had spared her life, Queen Helena cannot be said to have survived that fateful dusk. Afterwards, she would not eat, not bathe, nor leave her chambers, and she could no longer stand to look upon her son Maelor, knowing that she had named him to die. The king had no recourse but to take the boy away from her and give him over to their mother, the dowager queen Alicent, to raise as if he were her own. Aegon and his wife slept separately thereafter, and Queen Helena sank deeper and deeper into madness, whilst the king raged and drank and raged. While this whole war is set up as one of shadows and assassination and treachery, I think few of us could have predicted exactly how that played out in the later part of this chapter. I think the ending of this chapter certainly 
harkens back to a lot of the more brutal aspects of the way George likes to write. I know we got a little bit of that with Magor, but in my opinion, so far, the ending of this chapter has to be the most brutal scene up to this point in the book. And frankly, I have absolutely no idea how they are going to start the next season of House of the Dragon, considering that this is the next part in the story. With all of the horrible things that the original Game of Thrones show depicts, I find it kind of fascinating that this book is still able to make me real and think, is this something that they can actually show on TV? A really, really brutal response from Damon to the actions of the greens here and we are continuing to see the greens painted as much less sympathetic characters in the books at the end of the show i know there is some kind of question left to whether or not aemon killed luke intentionally or whether or not he was just playing around it seems like he wasn't able to get vagar under control where in the book it is very much so depicted as him in cold blood and furthermore with what alicent wanted to do to blood's family after the assassination i think that spells out a bit more about her character in the books versus the show definitely a lot different Interestingly enough, I feel like the interaction between Luke and Aemon actually played out fairly faithfully to the way it was presented in the show otherwise, with the exception of Aemon trying to court one of uh, the Baratheon king's daughters, and one of those daughters kind of goading him. I think that it was a fairly accurate depiction, but yeah, I am really not sure where they're going to pick up on the next season, because if you follow the logical order that's happening in the books, the opening scene of season two and the first episode would be this assassination. And, you know, you gotta leave it up to George for, in one of the most brutal scenes that I have read, not only in this book, but in literature generally, giving that classic little spritz of dark comedy with the assassins being named Blood and Cheese. I mean, we always have to leave it up to him to throw in a little bit of silliness along with this incredibly dark subject matter. I am definitely curious to hear what you guys think about this. Do you think that they're going to open season two of House of the Dragon with that ending scene? Or do you think that they are going to change it up to make it a little bit more friendly? They're going to sanitize it a little bit, maybe go back to that scene later in the episode or later in the season. Or if they're even going to include this at all, I would not be surprised if they just completely omitted this or wrote around it in some kind of way. And then also what you thought about this chapter generally, did they do a faithful job of recreating this in the show? Or uh, did they branch off quite far. I know we are starting to get into, I know we're starting to get into uncharted territory as far as where the TV show is compared to the books, which is exciting for people like me who have only watched the show up to this point. Everything that we are going to be getting is new content, which is really cool. So we're going to get that little bit of foresight into what the show might hold in the future and I'm going to be really excited to see what your guys' theories are for how they're going to depict that, what they are actually going to depict, and if they're going to choose to omit anything for whatever reason. So thank you guys again so much for watching. Let me know what you think and I will be seeing you all next week.